much. Okay, we'll call this meeting to order. Uh, this is a combined committee of the whole, operations and planning and in mid. Uh, I would ask you to rise as you're able for the reading of the invocation. <clears throat> As we come together today, we recognize the great responsibilities laid upon us. Our council will always strive to understand the needs of the people we serve and to use power wisely and well. Our purpose is to establish and maintain a city of prosperity and righteousness where freedom prevails and where justice rules. Let us also not forget those who served our community and who are no longer with us so that we can continue to do the work we must in their memory. Please be seated. The roll has been taken. Roll has been taken. Okay. Are there any members that have conflicts of declarations of conflicts of interest? Seeing none. Um, item 7.1.6, native species planning policy is already separated as we have delegations for this item. Uh, are there any other items that members of council would like to separate? Councilor Van Tilbord. 7.1.10. Any others? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Councillor Samwell, can you please move the motion to approve all items for consent and consideration not separated for discussion purposes? Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Van Tilburg that all items for consideration and consent not separated for discussion purposes be approved. Thank you. Seeing nothing further, we'll call the question. Uh, so all items subject to the vote are as follows. Item 7.1.1, Brantford Accessibility Plan 2022 <laughs> Status Update. 7.1.2, Brantford Municipal Housing Pledge. 7.1.3, road closing and conveyance for Pipe Street. 7.1.4, bylaw enforcement corporate policy updates. 7.1.5, payday loan establishment licensing update. 7.1.7, .7, renewal of the Grand River notification agreement. 7.1.8, review of city-owned lands for development opportunities. 7.1.9, repealing and replacing the City of Brantford Municipal Code, Chapter 429, Building Code Implementation. 7.1.11, Community Heritage and Cultural Space Task Force Report. And 7.2.1, the minutes. All items not separated carry unanimously on a recorded vote. Those voting in favor, Councillor Sullivan, Councillor McCreary, Councillor Carpenter, Councillor Van Tilbork, Councillor Sicoli, Councillor Caputo, Councillor Martin, and Councillor Samwell. Okay, we have no statutory public hearings on the agenda for this evening, so we'll go right into delegations. I'll now ask Susie Stones to come forward to speak to item 7.1.6, Native Species Planting Policy. Okay, your microphone's already on, so okay. if you could just give us your name and your address and then uh, proceed with your, Susie your Stones. presentation. You have 10 minutes, including questions. Susie Stones, uh, Myrtleville Drive, uh, Ward 2. Um, I know last time I, I was quite lengthy, so I'll try to zip along better this time. Um, so why are we wanting the, the native species um, planting policy? It's, it's basically because we really need to help our pollinators uh, Ontario is home to 400 species of native bees, of which they do the lion's share of pollination activity. 75% of food crops are, 75% of the food crops depend on those pollinators, and more than 40% of pollinator species are facing extinction. What are the three biggest threats to pollinators? Are invasive plants, disease-causing organisms which spread from non-native to native pollinators, and other stressors such as poor nutrition and pesticide exposure. And I think Gwen is gonna speak more on, on pesticide. Now, this one kind of surprised me. Um, obviously, we know monarchs can uh, fly a fair distance, but the smaller species are 
have a, a much smaller range. So that, that one on the bottom there is the green sweat bee, which is Toronto's official bee, only has a range of 500 feet. So it's like at my house, you know, that's four and a half houses that way and four and a half houses that way. And that, that's, that, that's really concerning that, um, that our pollinators really don't have much of a range that they need to be able to reach other populations that are around them. So if anybody needs to, uh, to remember anything tonight, it's this thing about habitat fragmentation, where we've, we've gotten so much to the point where we're planting things that are not native, that these pollinators um, can't reach other, uh, other things of their, of their species. So we're running into, into problems where the, from a genetic standpoint, the, the species aren't robust because they're, they're in isolated little pockets. So what we need to accomplish is the city really working together with, with residents that you've got areas where the city needs to really um, concentrate on increasing the number of, of native species, trees and, and smaller plants that we're putting in our parks and, and public areas but also trying to encourage um, residents within, within the city to, to, to help to join those areas together so that the, uh, so that the species can, can hop around and, and travel from one area to another and can interconnect with each other to make uh, corridors. Now, Mississauga is one of the um, municipalities that has approved people to be able to plant on their boulevards. This is a typical guideline that, that they're using. Um, so they're very robust with their um, blooming boulevards is what they call it. But it, it, you know, this is a good guideline. I'd like to say the, the city adopt something so that we have guidelines in place for people that want to do that and that they're not getting in, in problems with uh, property standards that it's like, oh, sorry, are you going to have to come in and tear up uh, what you've done because it doesn't meet our, our standards. And there's other areas where we can accomplish this too. Like right now, I know we have um, guidelines in place where commercial properties are required to plant a, a certain amount of percentage of, of landscaping on the properties. So if we could do something that, that would um, require a minimum percentage of native species to be included in, the, in that planting. So, you know, commercial condos, apartments, that type of thing. It's something that really wouldn't um, cost the city anything, but, uh, but would encourage uh, others to get on board. This is another opportunity here where the city certainly can be um, including more um, native species, uh, you know, ones that uh, enjoy specifically a, a wet environment. Probably swamp milkweed would be good for that one. Um, this is from the city's brochure, and you can see in the bottom left corner, that looks like that's an invasive species right in the front there, some dame's rocket. Um, it's, it gives us an opportunity too, to try to tackle more than, more than one problem just by doing something. So right now our, our city parks, uh, by and large, look like the one that's in the uh, bottom right corner, which is uh, Ann Good Park. So there's like a little bit of playground equipment, but by and large, it's just a gigantic green space of grass, which is fine for a uh, soccer ball, but it doesn't help our green canopy. It's not um, like our parks don't seem to be designed for the whole population. Um, if anybody have, has talked to Ed Bernanke, um, you may be familiar with what he talks about, but you know, you could knock off more than one problem by including um, mature, well, it wouldn't be mature to begin with, but if we could increase our, our green canopy within the parks. And then also the picture on the left is, um, it's a butterfly garden. There's just a little pathway, a bench, you know, it'd be more pleasant for seniors to come and enjoy. Um, enjoy your, you know, the parks. And if there's tree, if, if there's shade trees, then, you know, and juniors kicking around the soccer ball, but, you know, you could put a blanket down and, and enjoy, you know, for the rest of the family that are just watching, sitting and, and having some shade cover. 
and thinking outside of the box. Um, you know, we, we really need to start having some policies with teeth to them. We could require developers to retain existing mature native tree species in their subdivision plans. So there's quite a few pictures on online where it's like municipalities have just allowed this, you know, mature tree to be right in the roadway. So, you know, that would uh, certainly help with the traffic calming. Um, prohibiting the planting of exotic species in certain areas and declaring them as a public nuisance. Invasive plants are, are a big issue. Um, it would be nice if, if we were able to encourage local nurseries not to sell native plants. If there's no reason that they should be selling goutweed or ivy or periwinkle. Now, whether I don't know whether that's something that's doable, but can we encourage the Ontario or the federal government to get on board with uh, trying to implement things? Uh, oaks in particular are a keystone species that um, support more life forms um, than any other tree genus in North America. We have 11 species of oak that are native to Ontario. Um, not all of them are gigantic. Some of them are, are more dwarf species. Uh, this one only reaches a height of 20 species. And th these are just some trees that are, uh, are more uh, suitable probably for some of our boulevards. Hawthorn, hackberry, serviceberry, persimmon, hickory, oak. Buckeye, another oak. So we really need to 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 try to start um, getting these native species in there. And then this one, I know we've been in COVID and uh, having a difficult time of of making things happen. The mayor did take our mayor's monarch pledge in 2021, and I think it's time that we get back on track. Now I'm not I'm not sure that we did accomplish any of the items that are are on the list of the pledge, but. We're getting close with this one here, so maybe we can check this one off the law, off the list. It says increase the percentage of native plants, shrubs, and trees that must be used in city landscaping ordinances, and encourage the use of milkweed where appropriate. So, um, so like I say, this this policy that we have in front of us tonight is is getting pretty close. So it would be nice to uh, to tick at least one item off the list, and. Uh, so obviously this presentation isn't just for council, it's also for people within in the city um, to be able to get on board and start, start pulling out some of the invasive species that are on your property and start planting a few native plants. Uh, we're on Facebook, Brantford Butterflyway Project, and um, we certainly have a lot of uh, information and, and help if anybody wants to reach out. So if there's any time for questions, then... That's it. Okay, thank you. We have uh, half a minute left. Councillor Samuel. First, I want to thank you for your presentation. I know it's incredibly difficult to be in that seat. <laughs> I've been there many times. What I wanted to ask was, why was it so important to you to come tonight to be here to present? Well, I mean, our pollinators are at risk. And if they, they're the ones that support our, our food crops. You know, if we want to be able to eat, we have to make sure that we have a robust population of pollinators. So it's really time that we as a city and as citizens start to take this seriously and start to make decisions and put better policies in place that really have some teeth that can make a difference, right? There's just there's just no good reason why we're planting non-native species when we can be planting native ones and there's more advantages. Like, I mean, you're not dealing with, with um, issues of, of water run out, like they're more drought tolerant. You're spending less money in, in maintenance. Like once you get the plants in and established, they're really, it's gonna be less work for parks department less water going into our, our stormwater basins and, and the stormwater ponds and stuff. So it's, it's, it's smart from a lot of aspects. Thank you. That's a lot of important reasons to be here tonight. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll now ask Gwen Chapman to come up to speak to the same item. Uh, and you as well will have 10 minutes inclusive questions from 
from the committee. Microphone's already on, so just state your name and address and begin when you're ready. Hi, my name is Gwen Chapman. I live at 49 Drummond Street in Brantford. And please take note of the only picture that I brought today because it says a lot. If the bees are gone, we're going. There will be no people if the bees go because there will be nothing to pollinate the food. Um, I have a bit of a short um, um, thing tonight to read out. And uh, and then I'm here to um, answer any questions that you have that are um, pertaining to anything about the pollinator, what we're asking the city to do, the butterfly way, anything like that. So um, I'm actually here tonight to speak upon the behalf of the native pollinators, not the butterfly way program, the pollinators. One of the most valuable things you can do to support our ecosystem, wildlife, pollinators, and other invertebrate is to provide them with native trees and plants year round. The city of Brantford can make this happen by supporting this, um, whatever you guys call it, uh, for the native species planting. Uh, Brantford already has many people out there supporting native pollinators through the Brantford Butterfly Way program but we need to have the support of the city to continue to build pollinator pathways. Ideally, planting only native trees, especially oak trees is a great start, but the pollinators need native, native species and host plants to exist in more parks, neighborhoods, and green spaces within the city. Consider the following, turf grass that is not native to Canada and only has two inch roots um, is considered to be the ultimate perfection, perfect yard. But this perfect pristine yard that people have to mow weekly or sometimes twice a week produces noise pollution, air pollution from the gas uh, fumes. The fertilizers and pesticides used on lawns kill any beneficial insects that do live in the ground or that land on the grass. Plus these chemicals leach into the water storm systems when it rains, ending up polluting the water that we drink. Turf grass needs to be watered all summer to stay green. What kind of impact is that putting on our water treatment plant. When we don't get enough rain, turf grass goes dormant. The ground hardens and when we do get rain, the water just runs off into the road. Planting native species in front yards and boulevards would keep the rainwater where it should be. People don't like pests and those that don't like pests tend to pull out a can of Raid for everything. Raid kills bugs dead. Just like it says, there isn't a pesticide that kills the non-native pests. Uh, it just kills the non-native pests. It kills them all. Once they're dead, we can't re reproduce or the species, right? we can't reproduce them and the species dies out. For example, the non-native invasive spongy moth, AKA the LDD, AKA gypsy moth, is the perfect example of pesticide use killing in what we don't want to do. Our city con contracts for sprays of several areas of Brantford um, this was last year, including Mohawk Park, um, that is full of oak trees and Glenhurst Gardens. The manufacturer of the BTK say it's all natural and only kills spongy moth caterpillars. Well, that's a lie. That poison kills every caterpillar in the Lepidoptera family that eats falling, um, foliage covered in that spray. This includes butterflies like the monarch and many other larval stage butterflies or moths that are eating the plants. There's also a 100 meter range for this spray, like for the overspray. And in the case of Mohawk Park, the BTK spray enters the water and ends up in the river. And then we drink that. So um, well, one time we were the best blooming city in the Ontario or wherever we were. And um, I think we could do that again with the native, by planting native and helping the pollinators um, as much as we can. So I have a um, a thing I got off the internet that I wanted to share with you. Now this is American. So, and I mentioned when I sent everybody their homework stuff, if they all got it. Uh, the staggering wastefulness of the American lawn, or in our case, the Canadian lawn, 45 million acres of lawn, 
2 billion gallons of gas for lawn equipment, 41 billion pounds of CO2 emitted from leaf blowers and mowers, 13 billion pounds of toxic and carcinogenic air pollutions emitted from lawn blowers and motors, 100 million pounds of pernicious lawn chemicals and fertilizers, and 9, million, 9 billion gallons of water a day. That's what turf lawn, that's what the turf lawn takes. Plant native, the roots go deep into the ground. There's no reason not to plant native. It's a cost saving for the, for the, um, the city because they're not gonna be pulling plants in and out, in and out, in and out all summer. And they just stay there. They're perennials, they come back year after year after year. So that's it. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. We have uh, Councillor Van Tilburg first. Hi, Gwen. Um, thank you for the presentation. The, um, the city is going to be doing some initiatives, and that's what you're speaking upon. Right. But there's all the people living in this city. Absolutely. Where, and we, we, look, I just, I'm a steel worker. I don't know pollinators from whatever, right? So if somebody wants to do this and they know nothing like me, who do they contact so that they can start working on their own lawn? Because I'm sure when people hear that they want to have pollinators and bees and stuff, um, probably want to put in a certain area of their yard, but you know, where do they get that information? Well, I am one of those people that goes out and does um, talks to different organizations and they absolutely can go on Facebook to our, um, our, Facebook group that Susie showed. It's the uh, Bradford Butterfly Way project and surrounding area. It's not hard to find us. Um, we have over a thousand people in the group. We have a huge, big 200 plus pollinator pathway within our group. Um, and by all means, I'm, I'm available if anybody wants, they want help, library wants anything. Like we're going to, going to be doing stuff with the library. We want to get involved in the schools. Um, so it's it's out there. Just just look us up on Facebook. Thank you. Seeing no further uh, questions, thank you very much for your presentation. And we'll be dealing with this item next. Thank you. Okay, we'll now deal with the items that were separated, starting with 7.1.6. Does anybody have any questions or comments on this one? Sorry, Councillor Sullivan, you have the uh, resolution to put these items on the floor, I believe. You can state your seconder. Moved by myself, seconded by my ward mate, Councillor Scully, uh, that all items for consideration and consent, 7.1, 7.2, separate for discussion purposes, be approved. Thank you. And with that, we'll deal with 7.1.6. Any questions, comments? Councillor Samwell. So I have uh, just wanted to comment that I'm pleased to be supporting this tonight. The community, I've been watching the work of the Butterfly Way and the work on the pollinators. And I just wanted to say that it'll be nice to see the city having an opportunity to be doing our part as well. Thank you. Seeing nothing further, we'll call the question. Item 7.1.6, Native Species Planning Policy, uh, carries unanimously on a recorded vote. Those voting in favor, Councillor Sullivan, Councillor McCreary, Councillor Carpenter, Councillor Van Tilbor, Councillor Socoli, Councillor Caputo, Councillor Martin, and Councillor Samwell. Brings us to 7.1.10, Councillor Van Tilbor. This is one. You separated. Yes, I did. And this is regarding the planning committee. Uh, we had a pilot program where um, the committee was reduced to five people. And uh, we meet during the day and we handle all the planning uh, statutory hearings uh, for the developments in our area. And so what I've noticed is that that's to go to uh, ongoing and be full time. So I have a few questions about that. Um, one, what is the difference between 
being a standing committee and what is a statutory hearing, or is it a standing committee and we're still a statutory hearing? So through the chair, Heidi DeVries, general manager, people, legislative services and planning. Well, my friends from the clerk's department are going to come up, come up and answer this, I'm sure, um, in a much more articulate way. Um, the statutory component is under the Planning Act, where you're sitting as a quasi-judicial decision maker. Um, and the standing committee has to do with how you're positioned within our procedural bylaw. But I'm, I'm sure our clerk's department can expand upon that. So it's both, though. That is correct. All right. Um, the other question I have, then is what was quorum prior to, we want to reduce the quorum to three. So what was quorum for those meetings prior to the, the recommended change? Through the chair, Lisa Madden, committee coordinator, uh, quorum was four. Previously. Quorum was four. Okay. And did you do any asking of any of the counselors or any other counselors perhaps on their input on how they felt the pilot program has been going so far? So through the chair, um, following meetings, occasionally there were some discussions with counselors if they happened to provide comment, uh, but there was nothing beyond that. Okay, well, I guess this is our opportunity. Um, I, my concerns have been, one, I don't, without the opponents being there, because what happens is the rest of the council sees it at the next meeting. There's a lot of information that they may not be able to ask or get the answers for. And I find that's critical, especially right after the proponent's talked and then the proponent comes back and, and uh, redoes those questions. And that that's not possible with when the other five counselors show up at the second meeting. The other thing is I've very, been very used to everyone in council knowing everything that's going on in their ward in that, that level of detail, because I find that there's a lot of, a lot of years of knowledge in here. And I miss some of that knowledge of my co-counselors when an issue has come forward. And so that's helpful at the planning committee stages. The other thing that I've noticed is that the participation from the citizens is, is not there. Um, people are working during the daytime and they used to come to these meetings. I mean, often some of those planning committees would meetings would be fairly full. And um, I'm not seeing crowds. I'm seeing, you know, those that happen just be able to be off that day uh, availability. So I know there was some flexibility. And, 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 you know, we've said that we wanted to free up. I do know we have lots of, I mean, look, I can't, I don't have a crystal ball. What's going out there? But right now, what I'm seeing is we're meeting during the days for a planning committee. The, one, of the, one of those meetings was over in like 27 minutes. And then... We've been ending every meeting practically since Christmas or even before, and we're done 7.30, 8 o'clock. So there's time that we're not using. And I know before we were running into when we could have a hearing, yeah, we would have a 9, 9.30 meeting, um, and you, you couldn't do as many. So I'm just saying these are things that I've noticed, and I did not see them in you know addressed in that report, and that's what's coming from my side. So when we go to a quorum of three, um, it means, so we have 10 people here, and based when we go to the standing committee level of five, each other counselor can fill in for, um, for the other. So at three, it means there are, there are times, and this will be with my counselor Stanley and myself and probably other people, where neither ward counselor could be at a meeting. There is nobody to replace us. And we could, you could end up in a meeting, whether it's your own stuff or not your own stuff, it doesn't matter, where we have two counselors out of a total of 10 voting against possibly the mayor or three, three on a two-to-one vote out of an entire council of 10 moving something forward. If I had a, a quorum of four, if something didn't pass, it would be interesting to know why. And if I've got a three to one vote, I think that would be indicative of what council might see when it comes here. It will probably go to a six vote at least based on you know some of that information. So, so I've got a number of concerns about these. My, my thoughts was that um, I haven't seen that increase in volume yet. I haven't seen the need for this yet. I know there are some benefits in cost savings but there's also some loss in that community engagement. 
So I'm just going to take a break and let if some, anyone else wishes to uh, speak at this time. Good timing, Councillor. I was just about to cut you off. Councillor Sicoli. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, so I wanted to comment on this because I'm part of the planning committee and I also um, chair the uh, committee that brought this um, this report forward. So um, I will be supporting it tonight because I do think it's proven to be extremely effective and an effective means of reviewing these applications. And it's actually adding a, another layer of the review process. Um, so we're reviewing it quite thoroughly in detail without a time limitation in front of us as we um, anybody who was on council previously knew that we were sometimes sitting there during these statutory meetings for five hours and, you know, something is going to fall through the cracks at that point if we didn't make a change. So I think we're getting an, a more thorough review of, of these applications. It's going through a second layer of um, council, the council review process. Um, I definitely be supporting it. It's going to allow us to make sure that we're growing a little more uh, responsibly and appropriately and, and it's get, we're giving it its due diligence. It's really no different than any other committee. I don't sit on finance. I have no idea what's going there. I see it for the first time at council as well. Um, you know, so I, I, I do think I'm, I'm going to um, be supporting this tonight and I hope that I can count on everyone else to be su uh, supportive of it moving forward as well. Thank you. Uh, seeing nothing further, I'll, I'll make some comments. What what has to be remembered is whatever is decided at planning still has to be ratified by council. When it comes to council, all 11 members of council get a chance to see it, get a chance to ask questions. And uh, if there is something that's contentious, then it'll come out at that time. I think the planning committee is, is working well, is doing a good job. Uh, I know one of the early ones went most of the day. Um, I was unable to attend in, in Council McCurry's absence in the morning, but I was able to get here in the afternoon. And uh, the meeting had started at nine and I wasn't able to get here until around one o'clock and it was still going. So if we had to do that on a council night, mm -hmm. we'd have been here till midnight. And anybody who's been on council for any length of time knows that the decisions made after 10 o'clock aren't necessarily the best ones. So if we can avoid that, we can uh, hopefully uh, run the city a little better than uh, if we run into that kind of situation. So, Councillor Van Tilburg, did you wish to speak a second time? I believe there's still some first time speakers. Oh, oh sorry, Councillor Carpenter, I didn't see your hand. That's that's okay. Uh, doing a good job, Mr. Chairman. Uh, actually, uh, you're actually Mr. Acting Mayor, because the mayor is out of the country, so you're actually the acting mayor. Yep. So I'll address you accordingly. Thank you. Uh, just to, there's a, a number of meetings here scheduled, like May 11th, June 15th, uh, uh, July is the call of the chair, but there's a monthly meeting process. Uh, we have a lot of items on the agendas coming forward, do we not? Through the chair to planning committee? Yeah. Uh, that is correct. Uh, I'm anticipating uh, two for February, four for March. Um, I'm not sure coming to April yet. And depending upon how the interest rates go and the dollars go, we may have more. Uh, I'm hearing from developers on a regular basis that they're they're applying. So um, I know it's difficult uh, to uh, to take this out of the evening session where the public could have more say. I know that's difficult unless we find a way to add another day in the, in the council agenda. We probably could put a Wednesday on there or a Monday and it could have been done that way. But we have a, we, we've got an awful lot of items on our agenda development. Brantford is the place to be. Everybody wants to be here. We want to make sure that development is is done right and uh, proper and and that's why the one representative from each ward. Um, I, I know what Councilman Van Tierberg is saying. I know what uh, Councilor Hunt and I will share information on a pretty regular basis about how, what we're doing and not always possible. Both board councillors can't make those meetings and I know it's difficult. In the report, you have the planning committee stipend item 6.1. You talk about $11,000 as being the maximum. And that's if everyone took the stipend. Through the chair, that's so. Correct. As as members of the committee change from time to time to time, how does that change? How does the stipend change? Is that a resolution to council? So through the chair, the calculation was based on when it was initially passed, and the councillors chose to opt in or out of accepting that uh, stipend. If a councillor were to choose to opt in or out, 
my expectation would be that would have to be a resolution passed through this council again. Yeah. And at that point, we would then reconfigure that calculation. Okay. And the cost savings, you talk about the cost saving, savings, and I think we've actually seen it, uh, the number of staff hours to do planning proposals coming forward. I mean, staff are, are working a lot of hours to do a lot of planning, get planning in place. And now we have a new increased timeline in which we must meet those guidelines to actually get planning before us. Uh, the provincial standards have changed dramatically. So it requires a pretty uh, faster process, which I think we're all happy for. We, we we struck a committee just to make sure before the province, well before the province came up with the idea to move planning along mm -hmm. in a way that was more productive. And I, th I thank staff for doing that. Staff have done a tra tremendous job of making that happen. So uh, this we are we're we can actually quantify the savings in staff time and overtime by not having have staff here late into the evenings and sometimes waiting for their proposal that they're representing to come up maybe last sometimes. Should that not be a fair statement? Uh, through acting mayor to the councillor, that's absolutely correct. So what you see in the report is just a basic calculation looking at the average. So we've done four applications on average per meeting, taking into consideration the staff that are here to speak to those applications and support staff as well that are required to attend. We could be seeing upwards of 14 staff members in, in attendance for those meetings. That means that staff are not accruing those overtime hours when um, those meetings are held during regular business hours. Um, and and so just a basic calculation that we've included in the report can be in the range of a $38,500 saving for having those meetings in the day. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And uh, just uh, having said that, I, I don't mind putting the work in. It's something I'm actually interested in. I, I like planning. I like the planning department. I like the people. I like the work. I like the whole idea of building a better Brantford. It's been my slogan since uh, for 30 years now. And uh, we are doing a pretty good job here. And we could do a better job if we put more focus on it. And I think that's what this does. And to my colleagues, I know it, it's difficult for, for you and not always being able to attend. I'm happy to listen to any ideas that you have to make this better. But I'm going to support this going forward at this point. Uh, I was one of the ones that, that bowed out, by the way, of the statement. Thank you. Councillor McCurry. Uh, Chair, thank you very much. Um, and I, I want to reiterate some of what uh, Councillor Carpenter has said. I, I too chose not to take the additional pay. I felt a bit uncomfortable giving myself a raise. Um, but hearing what others have said as well, people who are interested in the process in the public will find the time to come and see us or they'll communicate with us. In some way, they'll make known their intent and, and um, they'll fear not, we'll hear from folks that want to be heard from. Uh, Brantford's not shy in that respect. Um, I look around tonight, we have four planners here just on this item. If we were having a hearing tonight, we'd be here all night and we'd have more than four planners. Um, so in terms of sharing of workload, Councillor Martin and I, we he sits on finance, I sit on social services. I know he's gonna look after the interest of our constituents on that committee. And likewise, he feels the same about me. So, you know, if, 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 if there's an issue that one of us wants raised, we'll raise it. Um, it's, it's a matter of learning to work together with, you know, in some cases, a, a new ward mate. We've been around a couple of years um, and, and know each other fairly well. So um, it's a matter of trust and it's a matter of sharing the workload. Um, so I, I, I'm very supportive of this. Um, I made clear my thoughts to staff about improvements that I could see with this. And certainly any member of the committee could well have done that. Um, I'm not shy and I, I look around the room and I don't see a whole lot of shy people on this committee or this council. Um, so, you know, as, as always, you know, if, if you've got input to offer, staff are always willing to 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 listen and to incorporate. Um, so this is this is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, it saves time from our folks rather than sitting here all night long uh, until God knows what time. And as Councillor Martin says, um, decisions made after 10 p.m. Um, aren't always in the best interest of anybody involved. So I would hope everybody would support this tonight. If you got further further uh, suggestions on how to improve the process, we're gonna we're we're a work in progress in terms of the planning committee and. And um, it's 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 going to evolve over time, and um, by all means, participate and and learn and improve. Thank you, Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, Chair. Um, like my uh, 
Councilor colleagues here said before me, I too uh, agreed to opt out of the stipend. However, I see the importance of going to an all day planning committee. Uh, I too will be supporting this, especially with the growth that's going to be looming over Brantford over the next 15 to 20 years. We need to make sure that we have all the available time we need to get things done. Thank you. Seeing no more first time speakers, Councilor Van Tilburg, did you have a second opportunity? Thank you, Acting Mayor Martin. Um, previous the planning committee, uh, the the hearings they were done at a committee of the whole uh, um, beforehand. Was that was that not the case? Through the chair, that is correct. And everyone saw them, and then they would come to City Council. Through the chair, that is correct. All right. Is there an extra layer that we put in there that I've missed in our planning committee? There is no additional. Uh, so it's the same, just a smaller yet. committee done in daytime. Okay. And it was mentioned that we have lots of time, more time to do this, uh, which I have seen in the planning committee. There's been more time. But isn't there not a recommendation to reduce the amount of time that people speak? Because I noticed in the charts, it showed the other communities and what they had for timelines. And ours has basically said unlimited. And now if I, if I read it right, does it not say that we want to put a limit on the number of the length of time someone can speak? Through the chair, that is correct. We will be uh, recommending a limited time. Well, after, after this passes, that would be the way. Through the chair, that is correct. All right. And how was those limitations? Did we have those limitations on previous committee, the uh, previous statutory hearings when they met during the evening? Through the chair, no. There so we didn't. Yeah, okay, thank you. We couldn't limit the time then, but we can now. Much appreciated, thank you. And yes, there are significant benefits to this change. Seeing no further speakers, we'll call the question. Uh, item 7.1.10, Building Construction Process Review Task Force carries on a recorded vote of six to two. Those voting in favor, Councillor Sullivan, Councillor Sicoli, Councillor Caputo, Councillor Martin, Councillor McCreary, and Councillor Carpenter. Those opposed, Councillor Van Tilburg and Councillor Samwell. Okay, that finishes off the separated items. We're now into resolutions. Councillor Caputo, could you move your resolution and state your seconder, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm moving this and the second by uh, Rose Sicoli. Uh, whereas Brantford, whereas Brantford Transit encourages removal of barriers for seniors to have safe, reliable transit services to access many community services and activities, and whereas the city promotes and encourages the healthy aging plan and encourages our seniors to use public transportation to participate in community activities, and whereas the city of Brantford currently sponsors free transit for all youth 12 years of age and younger to introduce public transit as long as commitment to utilizing public transit as part of their everyday life. And whereas the city of Brantford understands seniors may have limited transportation options and encouraging public transit as a viable alternative to automobile use. And whereas every June, the city of Brantford joins cities across Ontario to celebrate Seniors Month, with additional programming and recreational activities for older adults 50 plus. Now, therefore, be it resolved that staff be directed to complete a feasibility studies for seniors ride free program and present the findings to the May 2023 Committee of the Whole Operations Meeting and that the feasibility study include the rollout strategy, revenue, ridership impacts on both conventional and specialized transit, costs associated with implementation, and analysis of capacity during on off periods and that in recognition of seniors month in June staff be directed to provide free transit ridership between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. Sunday through Saturday on Brantford Transit conventional services or a 50 plus for the month of June. Did you want to speak to it? Actually, I do. Um, I think this is just the start of what needs to to be done for our seniors in our city. Uh, forever long uh, taxpayers, um, our population is aging. Uh, the costs of fuel vehicle um, are certainly uh, on a rise. And with inflation, the way it's been going, 
Uh, we certainly need to be able to address our seniors and giving them every opportunity to be able to uh, who to do things within the city while they're on a fixed budget. Even if a senior just wanted to take a ride around the city, I'm pretty sure there's going to be some astonishing findings for them as they go around. Um, so uh, I certainly believe that this is just a start of very something very small in terms of what we need to be doing as we move forward. Thanks. Councilor Sullivan. Thank you. Thank you, Acting Mayor. Um, I agree with uh, Councilor Caputo on this. This is definitely something that's a long term coming. I think we do need to branch it out at a later date, maybe even include some of the financial hardship issues out there that people have, have some type of a criteria enclosed. But right now, this is the, this is 100%. We want to encourage uh, our seniors to get out and get moving around. And that's going to do it. They're going to get away from their little four block radius of their home. They're going to get some self-esteem. And I think it's going to also help with their health overall as well, getting out and moving around. I think this is a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McCurry. Um, I'll try to repeat exactly what was said prior. Um, yeah, this is a great initiative. I heard this from a constituent uh, on the campaign trail, actually. Uh, it's done elsewhere. And I, I congratulate uh, the councillor for bringing this forward today. Um, it does. It does marry um, two, two, uh, two streams of thought. Number one, uh, for folks who may not have a whole lot of expendable cash, it, um, it'll get them out and about. Maybe introduce them to some things going on in Bradford they wouldn't otherwise have access to. And um, despite all our best efforts, some of our buses aren't full uh, all day long. And uh, you know, the, the, having seniors ride the buses, particularly in non-peak periods. Um, Will be good for the service as well. Um, so I, I, I'm happy to support this. After everybody's spoken, I, I would like to try uh, an amendment which was suggested to me by a constituent. May or may not be appropriate. I'll I'll leave that up to the committee, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Scoli. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to to thank Councillor Caputo for bringing this forward and allowing me to second it. What a beautiful way to honor and respect our our senior, our aging community. And I, I'm i willing to bet Lucy Marco is watching right now and is very, very happy. So I will definitely be supporting this. And uh, thank you so much, Councillor Saputo. Caputo, thank you. Councillor Carpenter. Well, times have changed, thank goodness. Thank you, Councillor Caputo. Uh, these are things we tried to get done many, many years ago and there was a tremendous opposition. In fact, I remember the opposition to try and simply get uh, parking fees arranged differently so that those that were in wheelchairs and accessible, uh, unaccessible, where they had long time to get back to their chair, try and have the time extended for those that had the wheelchair plate, plate in the window. That failed, by the way. Hamilton has it in place now. In fact, you can see it all over the place. Hamilton, very progressive when it comes to that. We still don't have that here, by the way, to provide access for those in wheelchairs, accessibility for parking. We charge them the same as everybody else. So I'm happy to support this. I remember I started my political career in the Public Utilities Commission. It was always a fight with the council. The day then we ran the transit, the water, and the hydro. It was always a fight to try and get revenue for the buses to run the transit system. In fact, there was a philosophy that uh, we would just be, with the, when the transit ridership went down, what we did was we reduced the funding for transit and the, the routes got worse. Hence, that's why you got the routes you got today. And back then, you used to be able to go 20 minutes to get around town. Not today. Still, it's two hours today. So because we failed to put the money into transit with the philosophy that, well, it's losing money. You know, it loses money because the service needs to be improved. And we need to move this direction. And a lot of seniors have no other choice. And so th this is a good move by Councillor Caputo. But we also need to think long term about it. You're not, if you want people to ride your transit, you need to make it work. It has to work. It has to get people from A to B, not an hour and a half, not in two hours, you know, but within 30, 30 40 minutes. It's got to be reasonable. So people aren't riding the bus for two or three hours a day and get to Toronto quicker than you can get on a bus out to the industrial mall if that's where you work. So and this is part and parcel to moving forward with a review of our transit system and building a proper transit system, you know, a 21st century transit system that we deserve. So I uh, thank you, Councillor Caputo. It's something I couldn't get done years ago. I'm glad that it can be done now. Timing was right. Thank you. Councillor Van Tilburg. 
Yes, I'm uh, going to thank Councilor Caputo as well. And uh, maybe the timing is just right. Uh, I, I can just see in the months, in, a, in, in that month period, where seniors will be taking the bus to go to appointments and to go to the grocery shopping and to visit friends and relatives and do things. And they might use it more and more than they than they can afford to. Those that are that those that use the bus and others that have never used it might start using it for the first time. And I'm sure they're going to start noticing as well the gaps. And one thing that you can guarantee from seniors is that if they see something that's not right, they're going to let you know. And so maybe we'll be able to use that feedback uh, from their months of service. And uh, we'll maybe move on to the next phase on, on how to uh, improve our transit. I, I do know right now, you know, we, I, uh, Rose is out east right at the moment, but I know a friend of mine is also out east, and that's former Councillor Rick Weaver, uh, Ward 1 as well, amazingly enough. And um, he worked really hard on our bus transit and on initiatives like this. He worked really hard. And I'll tell you right now, if he's if he gets wind of this or he's watching or sees it um, and this goes through, which I think it's going to, I think he'll be really, really pleased. Councillor Samuel. Yeah, I guess I just want to echo a lot of the comments that I've heard tonight. But um, yeah, kudos to Councillor Caputo in bringing this forward. I hope that it's something that we can see more become more of a long term effect after we uh, find it with the findings say, I think it's a great start to ex working towards to even expanding our age friendly strategy for the city. And I do agree that there'll be a lot of things that we're going to learn from this as well um, with the seniors uh, riding the transit. And I hope that that'll lead us in the direction to improve the transit for everyone. So thank you. Okay, I just have a few comments. Uh, unfortunately, I'm on the other side of the fence. One of the things we have to remember with transit is it's very heavily subsidized. Anything we do to reduce the revenue from the fare box, which only covers about a third of the cost of transit, means that it's got to be made up by other sources. So people that we're giving free rides to, we're also giving property tax increases to. So we're taking with one hand and giving back with the other. And we're taking from other people who won't use that service uh, to subsidize the ones that do. And uh, that's income redistribution, which is something that the other levels of government do with taxes on income. Taxes on property is a whole different animal, and it's, it's regressive in that way, and that it has nothing to do with how much money you make or how well you can afford your property taxes. It's based on the value of your property. A lot of seniors are in homes that were their family homes. It's probably bigger than they need now, but they're stuck paying the taxes on that property until they decide to downsize. And if we raise the taxes on that because we want to subsidize even more people who are utilizing transit, I don't see that as fair. So I understand that uh, what Councillor Caputo is trying to do is, is all in, in uh, good faith. Uh, it's been said that there's problems with our transit system uh, because of cutbacks. I don't agree with that. There's problems with our transit system because the way this city is laid out. The city is not laid out well for a good transit system. And unless we're going to start buying up houses and tearing up streets and rearranging things, that's not an easy fix. So to, anything we do to reduce the, the funding available for transit by reducing the, what we do get at the fare box makes any changes that we want to make going forward even more expensive. But I suspect I might be the only one to vote against this, given the comments that have made so far. Uh, oh, we have second time speakers. Councillor Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Acting Mayor. Um, you know, uh, we subsidize the Gretzky Center. Uh, we subsidize the Sanderson Center. Not everybody goes to the Sanderson Center, uh, Gretzky Center. We subsidize some parks. Uh, we, and not everybody goes to those parks. That's how you build a city, by the way. Everybody puts in together and everybody gets a piece out. Uh, and it's all about what the community looks like. So, you know, we, you know, we, it, aren't we throwing a $50,000 party for the, for the, Gretzky Center coming up this this year, that's on the taxpayers' back. Uh, not everybody will be able to go to that. Um, so, well, some of it's on the taxpayers' back, anyways. At least half of it. But uh, the question I want to ask is, where does the Operation Brantford Lift fit into this? And I don't know where that. Where is there a staff person that could comment to me how Brantford Lift is going to fit into this 
proposal because we have seniors that are uh, differently abled that they need Brantford lift. So would this, how are they paying and how would that work with them? Through Mr. Chair, Mike Spicer, Director of Fleet and Transit Services. Uh, we will be reviewing, Councillor, uh, the impact for Brantford Lift as it relates to the uh, free transit. The Seniors Day in June is specifically for uh, conventional services being a special program to promote ridership on conventional services, whereas Brantford Lift, uh, the current clientele, is uh, needing that service. So we're not looking to grow that service. We're looking at trying to introduce conventional services to our community and promoting that for the month of June may get more uh, senior uh, people utilizing our transit service. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, I don't think that was what I heard from the mover of this, that this is a growth promotion for one group and then we're gonna go back charging later. That's not the impression I got, Mike. Well, welcome back, by the way, Mike. Uh, I, I don't think that was, uh, was what I heard, and uh, the mover of the resolution can speak last. He hasn't spoken yet a second time. I just like to get that clarified because I know people on Operation Lift have to pay, and the rules have become quite stringent for those that use Brantford Lift and when they can use it, when they can't use it. Uh, you know, we we took it over. We said we were going to make it better. And, um, I haven't heard that from a lot of people. Not it's not your fault, Mike. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just saying maybe the funding's not there. But I'd like to know how this is going to affect if we're going to have. If you're going to be able to ride the transit free, uh, I'm just wondering why someone would say that, you know, I'm, because I'm in a chair now, I got to pay, but because I'm not in a chair, I don't have to pay. I'd like to get that rationalized somehow. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, if I may, just to provide some clarity on that. Uh, that is true, Councillor Carpenter, that if we do run a promotion on our services, it has to be both for conventional and specialized. So providing council and this committee with the feedback and the uh, costs associated with it and the ramifications is the report that staff will be preparing uh, to bring back a, at the May meeting to give you all of those details and what those impacts will be. Councilor McCurry. Uh, Chair, thank you very much. I would like to, um, I guess everybody that wanted to speak has spoken. So I'd like to introduce an amendment, if I may. Um, and as I said earlier, it may or may not be um, may or not be germane to what's before us, but uh, constituent Bill sent this to me uh, yesterday, and I'll, I'll quote from it and then phrase an amendment. Maybe an amendment or addition should be put into this that anyone with a disabled parking tag be allowed to park for free at meters and parking lots. City of Hamilton does this for their meters, just a suggestion. So um, what, I, what I would propose, Mr. Chair, is that the feasibility study include um, having a look at um, uh, accessible parking tag vehicles parking free in city lots. Did you want to second that amendment, Councilor Carpenter? Okay, it's it's not really related to the resolution, but since this is asking for a report to come back, um, Councilor Caputo. Um, I I would have second that as well. As I mentioned when I, I brought this up earlier, this is just the start. This wasn't something that was going to, like to me, free buses was the start of it, right? Certainly getting uh, Mr. Spicer to do his report and see what the feasibility would be for the lift was the second part. Um, parking is the third part. I think we need to look at everything when it comes to our seniors going forward. Uh, you know, looking at parking within in plazas and malls and everything as to where it's going to be. The aging report doesn't lie. Ten years that we make decisions today that have to become uh, the vision 10, 15 years from now. So let's start with this. We will move forward and see where we're going to go with everything else. But I certainly don't have any issues with the parking being added to this. I think it's just an added value to everyone involved. So thank you. OK, given the comments so far, uh, is the committee willing to accept the amendment as friendly and include uh, parking as part of the information to come back with this report? Seeing no objections. Okay, I had Councillor Van Tilburg next on the list to speak to the... Maybe oh, it's not an objection. So I just want to uh, remind Council that in the capital budget, uh, there is a parking or a study going to be happening in the, in the city as well. So. Not sure if, uh, if GM DeVries, if 
that can be included in, this, in the second the amendment, but I don't want to, uh, I just wanted to make sure that's also clear to her. Thank you, CEO Hutchings. Through, through you, um, Acting Mayor, um, that study won't be completed in, in the timing based on this, um, this current resolution that's before you, which I believe requires a report back by, by May. Um, but if, if this uh, council wishes to include that as a pilot and then we look to the parking study to undertake a deeper analysis, we can absolutely do that. Okay. So with that, Councillor Van Tilburg, the floor is yours. Thank you, Acting Mayor Martin. You know, I, uh, I, I agree with Councillor Martin when he states that it's a regressive tax when you're talking about property tax. And seniors that own homes are paying a regressive property tax. And that's wrong, and I, should, and I can't change that. But what I do know is that the money that they're spending can be spent on things like landscaping, couple roads for $500,000 that are going to benefit a few people on the street. Or there's a chance that not all seniors, some will probably be just as unhappy that, oh gosh, they're spending money on that. But there will be seniors that will benefit from this initiative. We deal with that fact every day. I honestly do wish I could change the regressive nature of the taxation system for municipalities because it really puts us in the squeeze and it's unfair. So it's a very good point. And, um, you know, there are times when I think that argument even has even more merit. But in this particular case, at least at this time, the seniors that are in the on fixed incomes in their homes paying taxes, they're going to see some benefit that they can take advantage of if they wish to. Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, on top of that, to take this to another level, um, especially if we do this on an ongoing basis, with their health improving from getting out and moving around where they, where they might not otherwise, they're obviously going to have less visits to the doctors. They're going to have less visits to the hospitals. They're going to be getting self-esteem. If they buy a cup of coffee while they're out, they're going to be stimulating the economy. There's a lot of spinoffs that can happen as a result of this than just looking at the direct uh, fair related uh, income. Thanks. Seeing no further speakers, we'll call the question. Item 8.1, including the friendly amendment, carries on a recorder vote of 7 to 1. Those voting in favor, Councillor Sullivan, Councillor McCreary, Councillor Carpenter, Councillor Rantoborg, Councillor Sicoli, Councillor Caputo, and Councillor Samuel. Those opposed, Councillor Martin. Thank you. It brings us to 8.2, Powerline Road Speeding. Councillor Carpenter, this one's yours. Thank you, Acting Mayor Martin, and I'll be seeking a seconder as my ward mate's not here. I see Councillor Sullivan has raised his hand, so Councillor Sullivan is my seconder. Whereas the residents of Bramwood Park area are reporting ongoing speeding concerns on Powerline Road, and whereas residents have raised concerns about the safety of pedestrians and the children in the area, and whereas the Pate family business is located on the north side of Powerline Road and holds several very well-attended community activities throughout the season, whereas numerous requests have been received by ward councillors to implement traffic calming measures on Powerline Road to improve the safety of Brentwood Park residents crossing the street to visit Brentwood Farm activities and businesses, and whereas Ward counters have been very concerned with the speed of traffic that travels through this neighborhood from Powerline Road uh, from Wayne Gretzky to the eastern city limits, and where several collisions have occurred on this location. And most recently, a young boy was struck and seriously injured by a vehicle while attempting to cross Powerline Road. Therefore, be it resolved that staff be directed to conduct various traffic studies with focus on road user safety, speeding, traffic lighting, or street lighting, sorry, pedestrian facilities, traffic control and traffic calming on Powerline Road from Wayne Gretzky Parkway to the Eastern City Limits, and that funding be provided from the Council Priority Reserve Fund to complete these studies and report back to Vision Zero Safety Committee uh, in Q2 2023. And just uh, if those of you that didn't know, it was uh, Mr. Pate's grandson that was uh, injured uh, visiting for Christmas from Saskatchewan, was here uh, walking back from Grandma's Place, which is on the corner of Powerline Road and Park Road North, and they're walking on what is only a shoulder because it's a it's city road, but it's um, a gravel shoulder. 
walking on the shoulder. And when they got down to the Pates farm, the young fellow decided he would go across to see grandpa. And, and uh, he was struck by a car and thrown in the air and very seriously injured and uh, wasn't able to go home till uh, just recently uh, from the visit. And it wasn't the kind of visit that one would expect, but we all, I, you know, we've been saying this for some time. The worry is Pates do the, uh, the Halloween haunted house. They do the hayride uh, in, the, in the fall. It's just jam packed with people because of the apple orchards and all the activities that are going on there. And Powerline Road is an access into the city. And so the Ward 3 Council certainly know that. They've had the similar concerns. Uh, and, and we just need something at that location to access people safely across that road. And just simply a flashing light, which we did put there, isn't enough uh, to make it safe there. So I'm just asking that all, all the council support this going forward, where staff will do the report about what can be done to make this road safe. And we'll finally have a safe road. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Councilor McCurry. Mm -hmm. uh, Chair, thank you. I'm happy to support this tonight. We often get around about solving long-standing problems, but um, um, it's it's a shame that so often somebody has to be hurt before we act. We had the same circumstance in our ward where a couple of children were struck by a car and that resulted in some additional traffic control. So I'm pleased to see this uh, coming forward tonight. Um, I got to say, though, that some of this is all about um, the dedication of policing resources to look after what this community says are its pressing needs. Um, and, you know, tonight we refuse to send the police budget back to, to discuss the addition of seven administrative staff. And when I consider the total value of the annualization of those seven administrative staff, that certainly would have put a maybe a couple of cops on the road that could be out there doing traffic and safety. Um, so uh, Councillor Carpenter has my support tonight. Yeah, seeing no further speakers, I'll make some comments. Uh, Powerland Road is an unusual situation. It was a boundary road between the city and the county. Uh, with the boundary adjustments, it's, it's come into the city, but it still has a rural profile. Uh, as Councilor Carpenter mentioned, as gravel shoulders instead of a, a boulevard and a sidewalk. All that will change as the north of Powerline gets developed, and at some point we'll, we'll redo Powerline Road, and, and I believe the, uh, we advance the EA for that road from uh, city limit to city limit to look at uh, fixing that, that problem with, within our city now. Uh, so if in the meantime this is what we need to do to make this particular area safe, then uh, this is a small step towards what uh, – would have happened in the future anyway, I believe. And uh, by getting this done now, we can hopefully avoid another incident where, where someone gets injured. So uh, I assume this is gonna pass unanimously, but uh, seeing no further speakers, we'll find out right now. Item 8.2 carries unanimously on a recorded vote. Those voting in favor, Councillor Sullivan, Councillor McCreary, Councillor Carpenter, Councillor Van Tilbor, Councillor Sicoli, Councillor Caputo, Councillor Martin, and Councillor Samwell. Okay, that brings us to 8.3, Brantford Landfill Gas Project. As this is my resolution, Councillor Carpenter, will you take the chair? Yes, I will. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Martin. Councillor Martin, would you bring forward your resolution and, 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 and name your seconder? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Sullivan. Whereas a clerical error was made in the initial application for the Renewable Energy Standard Offer Program, also known as RESOP, for the landfill gas project that saw the option for biogas not checked off, as a result prevented the second phase of the project from proceeding. And whereas without the second phase of the project completed, Brantford Generation was unable to meet its financial obligations to Infrastructure Ontario, which led to the sale of the assets to the city of Brantford at a discount. And whereas because of the discount, the deal included a clause that any profit made from the sale of electricity during the balance of the RESOP agreement will be split 50-50 with the province. And whereas because the project is currently at about a break-even point financially at this time, any profit from new generation will be split with the province. And whereas a phase two is allowed to proceed, it would generate approximately an additional 570 kilowatts of renewable energy. And whereas we're currently receiving rates of 
cents per kilowatt off peak and 15.27 kilowatts per hour on peak. And whereas all of this generation would be profit, the net cost of the province would be 5.875 cents per kilowatt off peak and 7.363 cents per kilowatt on peak for green electricity. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City of Brantford makes a formal request to the Ministry of Energy to authorize the independent electricity system operator to allow the use of biogas within the current RESOP program for Brantford's landfill gas project so that both the city and province would benefit and profit from this agreement. And speaking to it, this one thing that's not in the resolution that is also true is if we can get this change to the RESOP agreement, it'll open the door for us building digesters for the green bin operation. And uh, that has many advantages and it allows us to partner with some of our neighboring communities, uh, including Six Nations, Mississaugas of the Credit, Brant County, Norfolk, Oxford, and uh, to set up a a facility for dealing with the materials collected through green bin, uh, which in the past was a problem for us. We don't have a green bin program now because when we bid put out tenders for someone to take the material, nobody bid on it. And that's what prevented us from doing green bins far sooner than uh, than we are. And, and it's something that people coming from other communities that are used to it expect. And uh, they're wondering why we don't have that. And it's it's embarrassing to have to explain to people why we don't have a green bin program. But uh, this will open the door to giving us a, a method to to deal with those materials as well. And so hopefully the province will see this as a win-win and allow us to proceed with the phase two and, and possibly phase three as well. Thank you, Mr. G. Thank you, Councilor Martin. And for the speakers, I have Councilor Van Turberg, you're next, sir. I uh, just want to commend Councilor Martin for his tenacity on this file. Long before I was on council, this is what he's been championing. And it's taken a long time to get here. And as you can see, we're still not here. He's just getting to, to the second phase. And there's been many ups and downs. Um, but I think now when we look at the timing and what you might also not know, because uh, I remember when I found out, I was rather surprised that how strong an advocate Councillor Martin was for green bins before green bins were a thing. So a lot of his energy and time has been put into this file. And again, I just want to commend him on it. We're going to have the green bin program in place here. The timing's right to move in this to, to move in this direction in order to get that secondary re renewable fuel, renewable energy feeding off one another. So, kudos. Thank you, Councillor Van Tilburg. Any further speakers? Just for clarification, Councillor Martin, uh, when you say that the City of Brantford makes formal requests, you mean the mayor will sign that document as the head of council? Yeah, I believe that's the, the procedure that will be followed. All right, thank you. That is the right procedure. Okay, any further speakers saying none, I'll call the question. Item 8.3 carries unanimously on a recorded vote. Those voting in favor, Councillor Sullivan, Councillor McCreary, Councillor Carpenter, Councillor Van Tilburg, Councillor Sicoli, Councillor Caputo, Councillor Martin, and Councillor Samwell. And with that, I pass the chair back to you, Councillor Martin. Thank you, Councillor Carpenter. Brings us to 8.4, Brantford Exposure Printed Publications. Councillor Scoli, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. So moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Caputo, who brought forward a very complimentary um, resolution earlier this evening. Um, so Brantford Expositor Printed Publications, whereas the City of Brantford has continually committed to an age-friendly planning and to work with individuals and families to meet the changing needs of an aging population, and whereas access to information is a key concern for older adults across Canada and locally, our community believes that all community residents, including older persons, deserve to fully and meaningfully participate in and contribute to the social fabric of our community. And whereas a goal of the City of Brantford's age-friendly strategy is to increase digital inclusion of older adults through skilled training and access to technology, access to digital information remains a hurdle for some older adults and maintaining current access points to community information is crucial to maintaining social participation. 
And whereas the goal of the city's City of Brantford's age-friendly strategy is to improve access to municipal and community information, and whereas older adults in the City of Brantford rely on receiving their information through printed format, therefore it is resolved that A, the City of Brantford respectfully call upon the Brantford Expositor, which is a primary printed source for community information for many older adults, to rescind its decision to reduce the number of print editions each, each week from five to three, and that the clerk be directed to forward a copy of this resolution to the Honorable Larry Brock, Member of Parliament, Brantford Brant, and to the Honorable Will Balma, Member of Provincial Parliament. And if I may speak to this, Mr. Chair, um, as many of you know, on January 4th, our local newspaper, the Brantford Expositor, announced that they were reducing the number of printed publications from five to three. And the Expositor has been a community partner with the city of Brantford in providing this valuable information to the residents of Brantford. And although I very much understand our move into the digital era, um, the internet really does remain a hurdle for some of our more most vulnerable residents here in town, um, including the, our aging population. And I know for myself, it was quickly evident to me how much um, the senior population or senior residents rely on the, the printed newspaper for information in Ward 1. And I'm sure that same across the board for all wards. So um, to the expositor, I'm sure you're watching tonight. Um, I thank you very much for your many years of service, and I would respectfully implore you to uh, consider expanding uh, the print services back to five days a week for our, for our senior and our aging population to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Samwell. I just wanted to add that I'll be pleased to support this tonight. Uh, I know how important the expositor is to many people in our community, especially our senior population. And I think that we need to be working towards, I know that we, you know, um, digital is the direction that a lot of things are going, but we want to be careful to not create barriers for folks that are still preferring and better use uh, hard copies of things. And I think that this resolution to the expositor is a really important piece of that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Van Tilburg. Oh, I'll be supporting this resolution as well. Um, the problem, unfortunately, is, is larger than just the distribution. Seniors do rely on a local newspaper for local news. And even when it was more issues, that local content had diminished significantly. A lot of local news not reported. And that is the unfortunate nature of corporate and mainstream media today. And that, that's a problem, a challenge for them. I don't know how you get around it, but their focus has not been from their model to keep that local content going, uh, particularly in the print. And so seniors will say, yeah, I want the paper. And they do appreciate what's in there. But there, there's not enough in there. And you got that chicken and the egg. What, at what point do you pull the plug? And at the same time, is the expositor really slowly focusing its way into the way, it, while Brantford's become a big city, are, of all things, our newspaper is almost becoming a weekly community-style newspaper as opposed to a, 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 you know, a daily and so the idea that we want to see something back as a daily when they're cutting back and as advertising revenue, how does it all work? And I don't believe that short of possibly the current liberal government in the, fed in the federal sphere has taken an interest in, in the, the decline of media. And I think they take a beating for it. And um, this might bring the aspect to other members of parliament and MPPs that there is a community out there that wants to see it. But again, you know, this is the private business model. This is kind of the way news has always been. It's driven by advertising revenue, um, but definitely noble. Happy to support it. And 
yes, I know those reporters are watching or will get wind of this. And uh, I would love to see more local content and letters to the editor and the Brantford Expositor that are like from Brantford. Yes, Carpenter. Thank you. I, I think we all would like to see what once was, you know, um, we used to have CKPC radio station was, you know, you listen to that radio station every day. You listen to the sports, you listen to the birthdays. I mean, it was a pretty common thing to listen to the radio station. We used to have our own Rogers cable where Rogers was involved locally. And then it got spread out that Rogers was covering a large, large area all the way to Hamilton, or Kitchener, Waterloo, Wentworth, and Hamilton, Wentworth. Uh, the print media has been gone from this community for a long time, not just, you know, gone down from five days to three days. It's been gone for a long time and you can't blame the reporters or the people that work there. You got to blame the ownership. The ownership is saying, look, this doesn't make money now. Now we got to do something, you know, because the want ads used to be the lifeblood of it for every newspaper. Want ads have been gone a long time, you know, and the ads, the other ads are being delivered to your door through the post office or for somebody else that uh, you refer to junk mail. Those ads are coming to your doors that way because it's cheaper than having that advertisement in your local newspaper. So the paper is losing its revenue and they've lost their revenue, but they've lost a long time ago. As I think my, my uh, council, cal, council colleague here to my right has said, you know, they stopped reporting on, on a lot of stuff because they didn't have the resources because they, you know, they've been gone from downtown Bradford for a long time. That expositor building downtown, by the way, that's a student residence. The, the expositor building that used to be up there on Henry street, they're not there anymore. That's gone. They're not in this community at all. Now, some of those reporters live here and they're working hard to try and make a living on what's left of that ex Brantford expositor. And the expositor hasn't been printed here for a long time. So they've left a long time ago. Uh, I, did, I do notice that the Hamilton Spectator still produces a paper and they even have a section that, that has Ancaster in it and Dundas in it and Flamborough in it. Maybe they can add a section that's got Brantford in it. Maybe that's a possibility, I don't know. But the times have changed. What worries me the most, Mr. Chairman, about this is the media is, is that fourth pillar of democracy. Without the media playing a role in what goes on in a community and reports factually, not what somebody gives them or not what a, someone from our, one of our departments writes for them. And, and, and I understand why they do that because they're short staffed and they're not, they're not paid for the hours that, of the work that we, we required to get all the information out to the public. So they take what's, what's fed to them. And, and I think that the concern is the public doesn't get to know what's really going on. And even We even have a, a flaw in that in ourselves by not having a regular schedule so public can find out what's going on at council. We've had that schedule so that you need, you need to have a roadmap just to find out what's going on with council. And then we, we, we want the public to know what's going on as much as we can. And you wonder why the, electoral, the voter turnout was like it was. Well, it's easy. People aren't getting the information. They aren't finding a way to get at the information. I, I don't think we can lay blame at the, certainly not at the employees, certainly not at the reporters or anybody working for the expositor, whether they work in, or they don't work here. They work, except for the reporters who, who live here, they work out of town and uh, the, the, they're, they're just hanging on. And that's just the way the world is today. And there isn't funding, as, as, as Councilor Van Tilburg said, there isn't federal funding to, to subsidize uh, the print print media going forward or to keep them alive. It's a, it's a business and it's a business that's very competitive. So this resolution, I'll, I'll support it. It's really not gonna go anywhere. Nothing's gonna happen with it. They can't make a business provide five day a week service when financially it doesn't work. You know, when they, when they I, I don't know what the description level is. Is it down to 10,000? You know, uh, it's, it's gotta be pretty low uh, and it, it's not feasible financially. So unless we're gonna subsidize them, which I don't think we're going to do that, we need to find a way to get information to the public and it might stuff either come through us or another way. But I, I am concerned about as we switch from the print media to the digital media, when it gets get acceptable, then the medium and the in the in between that time, we lose a piece of our democracy. And that concerns me more than anything. Thank you. Yeah, I believe Councilor Carpenter is right in that uh, this resolution, although well-meaning, will not have any effect for the very reasons that he said. Uh, unfortunately, once a, a paper starts to decline like the, uh, any business starts to decline like this, it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
as they reduce the number of days, they lo lose some of their advertisers. The revenue goes down, they start losing their subscribers. The revenue goes down even further. They cut back to compensate for that, which continues the ball rolling down the hill. So as much as uh, I hope that there's something positive come from this resolution, I know it's very well-meaning, I'll support it, but unfortunately I am not expecting uh, miracles from it. So Councillor McCurry. Uh, Chair, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it is. It is a. It is a very uh, distressing circumstance when uh, a corporation that's been in this city for 150 years uh, appears to be on the ropes financially, and they're reducing uh, service as a result of uh, what's probably a very drastic decline in revenue. Um, you know, you look at you look at the uh, help wanted page. There isn't one. You look at the per sale page. There isn't one. Kijiji and um, Facebook and digital platforms have have cabbaged pretty much a lot of the revenue that newspapers used to get from um, from uh, from the contributions of business primarily. I I'm going to say what I said about the grant for bulldogs. Um, I agree, and no offense to the mover and seconder, but this is this is pretty much toothless, and um, I'm I'm not sure that we really should be telling a business how to run their business. We should probably be running our own business. But I would say this: um, you know, there's eleven of us around this table. I, I don't know how many folks here subscribe to the expositor, but uh, like I said about bulldogs, if you know, if you want to make sure that this is a success. The way to do it is to support financially, and perhaps if you don't subscribe to the expositor, maybe tomorrow morning you can do that. Um, and perhaps you know the headline in the community, and maybe the expositor reporters who are pretty darn good, despite um, despite that being a pretty skinny chicken over over there. Uh, perhaps that can be the way they write this story: is that this council supports the expositor. We're sad that they're declining. And that we encourage everybody to, to pony up and uh, send them a few dollars, buy the newspaper, subscribe to it. In the old days, folks in Brantford used to say they took the expositor. Um, and I, I've, I've been a subscriber since I came back here in 1990. And my family subscribed to this to the, to the paper for as long as, as I can remember. So um, let's let's, you know, let's put our money where our mouths are. Subscribe if you don't. And if you're out there watching this and you're going to read about this in the paper, do the same and, um, you know, support support this newspaper like you're supporting the Bulldogs. Pastor Sicoli. Thank you. I'll, I'll probably be the one to wrap this up, but I had the, some of the same reservations when um, we were putting this together. I wasn't sure if I should be necessarily directing a business on how to conduct their business. Um, I think this resolution is incredibly symbolic and, and it just says to our community that, or to our aging population, to our vulnerable population, we hear you, we understand the needs, um, we understand your needs. Um, and to the expositor, we're saying, you know, hey, we value you and the community needs you. And, and we can do better together. And this council values you and just acknowledging that, that we're at this, you know, this point of change, you know, so um, it's, it's symbolic and I, I hope I do have the support of it. And to anyone who is watching um, as count, my uh, council colleague said, Councillor McCurry, you know, time to, time to start subscribing, time to start um, ponying up and, 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 uh, helping the expositor out before we, we lose this crucial part of our community. Thank you. Pastor Caputo. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I agree with everyone and their comments, and uh, I do um, give you full kudos, Rose, on, on putting this forward. Uh, and to paraphrase uh, Councilor McCreary, the Bulldogs are coming to town. And uh, like most junior A hockey teams usually have a beat reporter that has to follow them city to city. Uh, there'll be write-ups on them on a regular basis, whether that stays only on its web page is still yet to be to see, uh, determined. Uh, but as we move forward with, uh, with the hockey team and with putting something like this forward, so people actually have the opportunity to, to buy the newspaper, um, who knows, maybe it just does have some teeth. So, 
Uh, okay, everyone, I'll be su supporting this, but uh, just look at the glass half full, guys. Councillor McCree. Chair, um, with your indulgence, I'd like to offer an amendment. Give it a shot. Um, the amendment would read, as an expression of support for our community newspaper, Brantford City Council encourages community residents to subscribe and support the Brantford Expositor. I believe I have a seconder, Councillor Samuel. Okay. That would be agreeable to me. Uh, mover accepts that as friendly. Any objection? Seeing none, that's friendly. Any comments on the motion as amended? Seeing none, we'll call the question. Item 8.4, uh, including the friendly amendment, has carried unanimously on a recorded vote. Those voting in favor, Councillor Sullivan, Councillor McCurry, Councillor Carpenter, Councillor Rantilborg, Councillor Sicoli, Councillor Caputo, Councillor Martin, and Councillor Samwell. Brings us to 8.5, International Women's Day campaign. Councillor Sicoli, this one's yours as well. Thank you so much. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Samwell, uh, who I've been collaborating with on this. Whereas International Women's Day takes place on March 8th every year to celebrate women's rights and inspire people to act in the ongoing fight for gender equality. And whereas International Women's Day is an opportunity to recognize the progress made to advance women's equality to date and to recommit to breaking down barriers and resolving challenges women continue to face. And whereas International Women's Day pays tribute to women's achievements and provides an opportunity to honor, support, and celebrate acts of courage and determination by ordinary women who have played an extraordinary role in our community as activists, workers, artists, entrepreneurs, caregivers, educators, volunteers, and leaders. And whereas the City of Brantford is committed to promoting equity and justice and ensuring women have the necessary supports to succeed. And whereas on the 112th International Women's Day, we encourage everyone to take actions against gender bias and inequity in support of the 2023 International Women's Day theme of embrace equity. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City of Brantford will recognize March 8, 2023 as International Women's Day and will continue to commit to working to secure the rights and full potential of women and create lasting solutions to social, economic, and political barriers women continue to face and that communications and community engagement staff will work with Councillor Sicoli, Councillor Samwell, and Councillor Hunt to develop a 2023 International Women's Day public awareness campaign, highlighting the achievements of local women and promoting actions to fight gender inequality. And that a maximum of $5,000 for the 2023 International Women's Day campaign be funded from the council priorities reserve. And that staff be directed to coordinate a flag raising on March the 8th to officially proclaim March 8th as International Women's Day in the city of Brantford in appreciation of the many achievements of the women of Brantford and those across Canada and globally. And naturally I have some remarks, Mr. Chair, if I may. On March the 8th, like my resolution states, we'll be celebrating our 112th International Women's Day and the theme is Embrace Equity. Um, recognizing this day was something that we began last year, as uh, something that I worked on with our former counselor um, in Toski, and I'm now super excited to uh, expand on this through collaboration with both uh, Councillor Samwell and Councillor Hunt. So this resolution is about breaking down the barriers of gender bias and raising awareness of the inequity that still exists today. This resolution is about how we women respond to these stereotypes and continue to forge our path forward into leadership roles, skilled trades, science and technology roles, and anything else that our hearts desire. 
This resolution is not about burning down the patriarchy, okay? It is about growing towards a community where gender bias doesn't matter and we work together as equals side by side. This is about acknowledging how far we've come because not that long ago, people like myself and Councillor Samwell and Councillor Hunt wouldn't be allowed to have this stage before us. So behind every successful woman is a village of other successful women. And I just wanna remind everyone to continue building each other up, have each other's backs. And to all the women out there who are watching, keep up the hard work, keep building each other up, Keep breaking down those barriers. My favorite part is keep encouraging our daughters to play hockey and take up a skilled trade. Keep having these hard discussions. Keep fighting, keep grinding, and keep going until we don't need to talk about this anymore. And that's all I'm going to say on this. Thank you, guys. Well, it sounds like a real contentious issue. So any speakers to this? I'm going to go out on a limb and once again uh, predict a unanimous vote. So with that, we'll call the question. Item 8.5 carries unanimously on a recorded vote. Those voting in favor, Councillor Sullivan, Councillor McCreary, Councillor Carpenter, Councillor Van Tilbor, Councillor Socoli, Councillor Caputo, Councillor Martin, and Councillor Samwell. That finishes resolutions, brings us to notice of motion. Councillor Van Tilburg, if you could read the title of your notice of motion, please. Brantford Accessibility Committee Quorum. And with that, we are adjourned.